This is CBC Here and Now. Well, it's the eve of Regatta Day. This is a live shot of Kitty Vitty Lake. If the forecast holds, you'll have a holiday in St. John's tomorrow, shaping up to be a great race day. A bit on the cool side. Details coming up. Now, the Premier wants this former cabinet minister to be speaker. Why another Liberal is eyeing the legislature's top job. Regatta Roulette? Well, not this year. We go lakeside as vendors are setting up for the 199th regatta. It's more beautiful now that you're here with me. Oh. <laughs> she got a surprise visit while visiting the House of Assembly. We'll introduce you to the Albertan who's now toured every legislature in the country. Welcome to Here and Now. A Labrador man can check coast-to-coast -coast bike ride off his bucket list tonight. Matthew Pike of Happy Valley Goose Bay finished his Cross Canada bike tour today in St. John's. Pike was pedaling in honor of his cousin Craig, who died three years ago at age 34. His cousin had spina bifida and spent his life in and out of hospital. Pike's goal? To raise $10,000 for the local chapter of the Children's Wish Foundation. Children's Wish Foundation is near and dear to our family, so he was a wish child. Obviously, he got to meet the Wayne Gretzky when he was a young fella. So we picked this charity and the response has been fantastic. Now Pike set a goal of raising $10,000, but more than doubled that on his cross-country journey. But it wasn't always easy. Hear about some of the challenges he faced coming up in about 40 minutes on the show. Well, in court in St. John's today, Kyle Morgan was sentenced to one year in prison and two years probation in connection with the brutal death of Stephen Miller a year ago in Conception Bay South. It was a joint recommendation by the Crown and Defence. Judge Colin Flynn says he has no choice but to accept it. Here now is Glenn Payette reports. Kyle Morgan was one of four men charged with the murder of Stephen Miller in July of last year. But last month, Morgan pleaded guilty to being an accessory after the fact to manslaughter. Today, Judge Colin Flynn said he had no choice but to go along with a joint recommendation from the Crown and Defense to sentence Morgan to a year in prison and two years probation. Flynn said he would have given Morgan more time, but couldn't because of a decision out of the Supreme Court of Canada. Flynn said, accepting the low sentence would not bring the administration of justice into disrepute. He wrote, joint submissions, even if they reflect a lower penalty than normal, must be sanctioned by trial courts in such circumstances. And continued, I am therefore bound to accept the joint submission in this particular case. Flynn gave Morgan three months credit for time served, so he has nine months left on his prison sentence. Morgan's parents were noticeably upset as he was being taken away. Meanwhile, Chesley Lucas and Calvin Kenny were also charged with Miller's murder and last month pleaded guilty to manslaughter. Last week, the Crown and Defense recommended they get seven and a half years in prison. They're back in court in September. The fourth man, Paul Connolly, is still charged with Miller's murder and has a preliminary hearing slated for next week. Because Connolly's case could still go to a jury trial, there's a publication ban preventing us from reporting the facts that led to the convictions of the other three men. It also prevents us from reporting the facts that led to the joint submissions on sentencing. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. Well, it was supposed to be an easy transition. Yesterday, as the Premier took Perry Trimper out of his cabinet, he endorsed him to go into the Speaker's chair. But now another name has emerged that might scuttle the Premier's plans. Liberal Pam Parsons is interested in the job. Here now is Terry Roberts is joining us live from the floor of the House of Assembly tonight. Terry, what's happening here? Well, yes, Peter, uh, in announcing that uh, cabinet shuffle yesterday, that surprise cabinet shuffle, Premier Dwight Ball said that he will be taking Tom Osborne from the speaker's chair right up front here and putting him on the front bench as the province's new finance minister, replacing uh, Kathy Bennett, who resigned suddenly yesterday. Now, by sitting him right here, he's at the right over the right shoulder of the premier. Clear enough. Well, the premier also announced that he had plans 
for the person who would fill the speaker's chair. Even though this is a position that's elected on, uh, voted on by members of the House of Assembly, the Premier said very clearly that he wants Perry Trimper, the former Minister of Service NL, to become the next speaker, calling him a remarkable individual yesterday. And here's what else the Premier had to say about Perry Trimper. Uh, you know, Perry can do a great job in my, in, in my belief uh, as, uh, as a speaker, but of course that's a, a vote that would occur in the House of Assembly at some point. Uh, yes, but it might not be, but it might not be so clear cut. That's because this woman, Harbour Grace, Porter Grave, MHA, Pam Parsons, may just complicate those plans. Parsons told me today she's been getting encouragement from her colleagues on both sides of the legislature to challenge for the speaker's chair. She says some federal MPs have also reached out to her, but she wouldn't give any names. There's never been a female speaker, and Parsons believes she has the qualifications to change that. Now, Parsons told me today she wants to speak with the Premier before she makes a decision on this, but even by speaking publicly with me today, she's in clear defiance of the Premier's wishes. And imagine if she does challenge for the Speaker's chair, and if she wins. Well, I tried to pose that question to the Premier's office today, but I didn't get any response. So as for Perry Trimper, the former Minister of Service NL and the Office of Climate Change, he told me today he's very disappointed that he was removed from Cabinet, but he's ready to move on with this next challenge. Well, you know, enjoyed my time in Cabinet. It's a great honour. last 20 months have been a, an adventure that uh, a guy coming from a career in private sector would never have imagined. So uh, while I'm leaving that with, uh, you know, some disappointment, uh, looking forward to this new challenge and, and putting my name forward as the Speaker of the House of Assembly. Now, all of this will play out next week. The House of Assembly will reconvene, reconvene for a special sitting on Tuesday to elect a new Speaker by secret ballot. Reporting live from the floor of the House of Assembly here in St. John's, I'm Terry Roberts for Here and Now. Thanks, Terry. A damaged boat is causing quite a stir at a popular beach in Notre Dame Bay. Well, check out this drone footage. The Straits Foam, that's the blue boat that you see there, was damaged during harsh ice conditions this past winter. Now there's been a temporary road built to the beach in order to try and reel in that vessel. Mayor Wayne Purchase says the ship will be dismantled and taken to a landfill site in order to be properly disposed. A group of RNC officers are trading in their service uniforms for volleyball jerseys. This weekend, a local team will travel to the World Police and Fire Games in California. It's the first time that an all-female team will attend the event. Here and now's Jeremy Eaton caught up with them at their final practice. Team started, our first meeting would have been uh, November of 2015 with the idea of putting a team together to compete at the 2017 World Police Fire Games. And from there we've just kept on going. We had tryouts and practices. Um, it was last June we selected our final 12. We're actually going to all the way to LA to the World Police and Fire Games to participate in a volleyball competition there. Um, there's several different sports and police officers and firefighters and paramedics as well uh, all congregate there and playing the games for fun and also there's some competition there as well. The World Police Fire Games, uh, they've been on the go since 1985. They're awarded every two years in different host cities. Uh, it's actually the second largest sporting event behind the Summer Olympics. Right now there's over 8,000 athletes registered for this year's games. A lot of family have helped with the family aspect of it. Um, babysitting kids and stuff like that, running them around. And during work, all of our supervisors have been great, letting us go to practice when we can, even if we only go for half a practice. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. They put a lot of time, a lot of work, effort into it, uh, like I say, since December 2015, so huge deal. Having to work together to fundraise for the tournament, as well as participate in these, in these tournaments, have uh, certainly helped us get to, you know, that bonding aspect and get grow as a team together. Lots of action lakeside tonight as vendors get ready for tomorrow's 199th Royal St. John's Regatta. This is a live shot of Kitty Bitty Lake. 14 degrees out there right now. Lots of cloud cover, expecting some showers to move through and a drizzly start to the day tomorrow. I'll have all your details about the regatta coming up.
Time to bring Carol in now with that all important look at the forecast because whether or not you're going to be rowing in the regatta, mm -hmm. down visiting the regatta, or getting the heck out of town and enjoying your day off, <laughs> yeah. you probably want to know what the weather is going to be like. It's like the most important weather forecast of the year. Unfortunately, things are looking pretty good. It's a pretty easy one. Uh, things are looking like a green light for tomorrow for sure. So let's get to uh, some of the details on that. This is a, a little summary of what's to come tonight. Some showers and drizzle for most of the island. So if you are heading down lakeside this evening, then you'll want to bring a coat probably with a hood. And uh, regatta day, we're looking at a rinse and repeat. And what I mean by that is basically tomorrow is going to be very, very similar to today. So temperatures a bit on the cool side, a bit of a gray day starting off with some drizzle, but no worries. Temperatures will be rebounding as the week goes on. So I'll have those details in a little bit. So these are the highs for today. You can see how cool it was on the island. Temperatures really just in the mid teens. So that's going to pretty much stick around for most places tomorrow. Today in Lab City, 18 degrees as the high. So a bit warmer up there. This is a, a system that's Moving over the island tonight, it's uh, going to bring some thunder showers to the west coast and it's moving uh, to the east. So that's what's going to bring some showers uh, across the Avalon this evening. So looking ahead to tonight and tomorrow, those are the showers that I just showed you on the radar there. That'll start to move out overnight. Things are fairly clear along the coast uh, of Labrador there. So that should start to move out by the morning, but things you can see that there's still a lot of cloud cover. So tonight, pretty cool, pretty drizzly for most places, heavier rain uh, in central and on uh, the west coast could get up to about 15 millimeters there with a risk of thunder showers. Cool up along in name, but fairly clear uh, tonight with some cloud cover and six degrees as the low. So this is the all important forecast uh, that we're going to show you the whole province for now because you can see the showers that will be moving in uh, in lab west tomorrow and some showers on the Avalon Peninsula. Things will start to clear off later in the day. So this is a really nice tight look at the Avalon Peninsula so we can see what kind of precipitation we're looking at. This is tonight, the showers that will be uh, moving across this evening, 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, lots of cloud cover, uh, some patchy showers, some drizzle, but it should start to clear as the day goes on. We're looking at a high of about 14 degrees, but as you go inland, it should be warmer, about 18 degrees inland. So it'll be pretty cloudy. It'll be a gray day, but things will start to clear off. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're going to start the day with uh, a chance of drizzle in the morning, 13 degrees as the high. And uh, the winds, of course, huge factor for the regatta and really not much happening there. Southeasterly winds uh, turning to east winds uh, throughout the day, 20 kilometers an hour. So not a whole lot uh, happening there. Wind wise going to be fairly calm on the the lake going to get up to about 14 degrees, mainly cloudy skies as the day continues, though it should clear off. So if you're heading to a patio or something tomorrow night, things should be uh, looking pretty good by then. So looking at temperatures for the, the rest of the province tomorrow, some showers in central parts of the island heading up to 18 degrees in Grand Falls, Windsor and Gander. Pretty nice day in a bay vert, uh, some cloudy skies with 20 as the high. Looking great on the west coast tomorrow. Temperatures in the low 20s with some sun and some cloud. Very light winds as well. Getting into some showers up along the straits here and some cooler temperatures. Cartwright is looking lovely with some sunshine and 21 degrees. And uh, as we look at the rest of Labrador, looking great in Makovic tomorrow. A mix of sun and cloud there and 23 as the high, but we do have some shower action in Lab City and Churchill Falls and temperatures there at about 18 uh, degrees. So uh, tomorrow may be cool for many places, but temperatures should be rebounding later in the week. Uh, I'll have those details later in the long range, but right now let's head back to Kitty Vitty Lake where all of the action is. This is a live shot of what's happening there this evening. Everyone's getting ready, working hard, trying to get uh, their booths set up and uh, of course, the rowers in anticipation for tomorrow, they're not the only ones working hard to prep for the Royal St. John's Regatta. Here now is Allison Sampson was lakeside earlier today speaking with some of the vendors about another important 
regatta attraction, the food. Regatta prep is underway this evening. Food trucks are already anchored, waiting for tomorrow's sea of people. For the crowd, it's all about the fun and games. But for people working the concessions, the work starts long before regatta week. It's a lot of prep. I mean, in what I do with face painting and balloon twisting professionally, the stencils, the paint, compressors, canopies, tables, um, design set up, options for the kids to pick from. So a lot of the work happens before the event that people don't really see, but um, like everything, attention to detail makes the difference. And in case you're wondering, that was a caterpillar. This is the second regatta for the Blue on Water food truck. It's one of their busiest days of the year. Just the uh, prep for the regatta, I mean, you're, you go through so much product, um, so it's just, just constantly cooking and prepping over and over all day. And tomorrow we will be open for breakfast, bright and early for anybody that's down here. So come on down, we got Old Dublin Bakeries, um, cinnamon buns, and we're doing some breakfast sandwiches with moose bologna and all kinds of fun stuff tomorrow. Whether you're coming to watch the action on the pond or to eat your way around it, the only work for you to do is to decide what you want. And these people, they're all ready for you. Allison Sampson, CBC News, St. John's. Well, she's visited every legislature in Canada and says she saved the best for last. We'll introduce you to Cheryl Newfeld after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Lots of people are traveling the country this year to celebrate Canada 150, but not everyone is making a trip quite like Cheryl Newfeld. The Albertan is visiting every legislature in the country, and she said she left the best for last. Well, I met up with her as she made her last stop to the Newfoundland and Labrador House of Assembly, and as even someone who covers politics, I had to ask, what's with the fascination with legislatures? Uh, I would have to say my grade 10 t history teacher really influenced uh, my love and passion for history. But, uh, you know, it's the greatest bucket list for, uh, for anybody that lives in Canada to visit every part of our country and all the capital cities. And, and it wasn't just the provinces, you made it up to the territories as well, which that's is, correct. that's that's the bigger challenge. Yeah, that's a huge challenge, actually. So you've saved Newfoundland and Labrador for last. Give us a rating here. How does the legislature here compare to all the other ones that you visited? Well, it's uh, it's incredibly modern, but, uh, you know, you guys just joined the party in 49, I think. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's quite neat. Uh, I, I see so many... Uh, uh, different similarities. I'm really excited about seeing the maces in each place and you know how everything the position and history of where the seats are and all that kind of stuff. So your decor is um, gentle uh, but Newfoundland is definitely I have saved the best for last. And what's what have you sort of taken away from this experience of going and seeing each of these legislatures where politicians sit, pass laws, make decisions? Well, that's the common denominator between all our provinces and territories is a legislative assembly. However, I think it's the uniqueness of the history of the building and what's gone on in here. For me, it's not so much about, uh, I'm not gonna wave a flag on what party I'm uh, in favor of. The people and the politicians do leave the building, but this history stands here for all of us to witness over time. Okay, so we have a little bit of a surprise for you. Uh, we wanted oh, to introduce wow. you to someone. Wow. Right on. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm, Peter. Did I'm you? fantastic. Now, do you recognize yes. who this is? Yes, this is your premier. Impressed? Because yeah. not a lot of Newfoundlanders might necessarily be able to identify the premier of Alberta. Yeah. So. Oh, wow. Right on. I'm fantastic. Well, uh, welcome. I mean, met with your premier just last week when we were in Edmonton. Oh, Mrs. Notley. Yeah. Ms. Notley. Ms. Notley. Yeah, right. right on. Oh, that's brilliant. So you drop by for a visit and have a little chat with Peter. Yeah, and uh, you know we can go for tea. <laughs> Actually, of course we can. Well, we already got screeched in, so maybe coffee here or something. And you remember it? Uh, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> Good for you. This is fabulous. So, what do you think of this legislature compared to what you see? Uh, it's beautiful. It's more beautiful now that you're here with me. Oh. <laughs> Well, this one is a little different. I was actually in yours just last week in, in Edmonton. Wow, <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> well, not a lot of people that you, uh, that you run into, it's actually come when they come to visit, they actually look at the legislature and say, you know what, that's a place I want to visit, but it's a big part of history. Oh, it is. It's remarkable, and everyone is so unique, and yet we're all together, binded together. And you know that Alberta and Newfoundland and Labrador, like we're we're pretty close. Yeah, you so are. You guys lot, are tight. A lot of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have family in, in Alberta. Yeah. So we had some people up there during the wildfires last year as well, too. Well, we, you, 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 uh, the Newfoundlanders made a huge impact with working in Fort McMurray and throughout our province, too. It's good. So, yeah, that's uh, all. That's so now fabulous. you got to come in to sit in my chair. Yes! <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah! <laughs> this is incredible. Ha <laughs> well, ha! There it is. High five, guys. <laughs> Oh wow, this is beautiful. It's right there. Right on. Take over. Oh my. There it is. So we now have I had the uh, great fortune to meet your lieutenant governor too. Oh, he's a great, a lot, yeah. of, a lot of great couple, eh? <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you. Well, no, Holy, yeah, I've got the whole goosebumps going on here. This is crazy. Yeah. Well, the chair feels good and you have a really good view. We've got a good view <laughs> and it's a lot closer than people think. Yes, it is, yeah. Two sword lines. Oh my. Good. Well, welcome. Hey, thank you welcome so to much. Welcome the job. That's it, my pleasure. Solve it's an honor. Solve some of problems for us right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, then we will have to go for a cocktail okay. over that. <laughs> More screech. Yeah, that's it. Thank that's you, good. sir. That well, was brilliant. You. I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thanks for visiting. Oh, this is a great I problem. can't wait to come back and I'll be telling all my friends to come here too. <laughs> Love her enthusiasm. <laughs> Well, I guess if you're someone who goes and tours a lot of legislatures, then, you know, the excitement of getting to go and sit in the Premier's chair, it's something that's uh, certainly not for everyone, but mm -hmm. certainly for her was a 
big highlight. So who yeah. knew like an untapped tourist attraction? <laughs> and <laughs> for yeah, a specific it, person. And they do have tours up at the House of Assembly yeah. on a regular basis during the summer. So yeah, no, it is something that you know when you're looking for an activity, uh, mm -hmm. an indoor activity when the weather isn't good. Although that hasn't been an issue lately. Yeah, and talking about activities, but outdoors, of course, tomorrow is the regatta. Right. Yeah, and most people are looking forward to having the day off tomorrow in St. John's mm -hmm. at least, and uh, lots of optimism. It seems that the regatta will go ahead. Yeah, something really strange would have to happen for for it not to go ahead. So uh, I spoke with the president of the regatta committee, Paul Rogers, about that and how the event is shaping up this year. So it's regatta eve. A lot of people heading out tonight playing a bit of a regatta roulette, but how safe of a bet uh, do you think it is that the regatta will go ahead tomorrow? Well, you know, we got to rely on our weather forecast, but tomorrow looks like it's going to be a really good day. Like, I think the winds will be down, and uh, I think as far as rain for con our concessionaires, I don't think there, there might be a few drizzles in the morning, maybe, but uh, I think it's going to be a good day, somewhat like today. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about the process uh, that's going to unfold tomorrow morning when that decision is made. Tomorrow at 5.30, uh, there's a meeting that we that starts for all our regatta committee members. We get together. Um, the captain of the course and the vice president uh, runs that meeting. We'll just introduce it. There's only one agenda item and it's about the call for the regatta. We'll go through our weather forecasts that we have available, uh, the most up-to-date ones that we can get, and then there'll be a motion put out to the floor on uh, the, uh, the call for the, for the day. So lots of vendors down here this evening uh, getting ready for tomorrow. Uh, what's what's the participation like this year? Do you have lots of people taking part in the regatta? Well, I was just talking to Gerard Dorner, who's our director of ground space. We're sold out, so we're full. So the pond, as far as uh, concessions there uh, are, we're full. And how about the races tomorrow and, and the number of teams? Well, we have 100 crews. Uh, we have 20 of those which are squirts, which is our, gra our grassroots teams. So they're, they're, that's a great uh, representation. But uh, we have 61 uh, senior teams. And uh, then we have uh, a couple of uh, like juvenile intermediate crews. So there are 100 crews. There'll be 23 races and, a champ and two championship races for a total of 25. Okay, and squirts. Tell yeah. me about that. Well, that's our that's our uh, grassroots. So they're the, our, ju our youngest uh, participants. So they're between the ages of 10 and 13. They only row one way, so they don't have to turn a, a stake, as they say, or a boy. So they'll just come down the row one way, start at the top of the pond, and go to the ladies' kegs, and that's that's how they row. And that's our basically, they are grown. Uh, I'd say about 25% or more, uh, so that those are our future. So we really want to see those people down there, those young people. It's great, great news. And how about the number of teams this year? How how does it compare to past years? Last we we are up a little bit. I think uh, we're up probably uh, four or five crews. So you know that that's again says you know we're growing, and a lot of that growth. 30% of our crews are under the age of 16. So there you go. So this question comes up every year when people are looking at the regatta. It's the only weather dependent holiday uh, in the country. Yeah. Why do we keep doing this? Why do, where does it come from and why do we keep doing this? I think you'll probably hear a lot of things about it, but it probably comes from the colonial days when the Wednesday used to be a half day holiday. So instead of businesses losing a full day of business, they would just do it on the Wednesday. But now, of course, that's gone now, but everyone, so it's a full day gone now. But I think that's when it all started, probably in the 1860s or 70s, like that. But that was a, that's what we, we were saying it was about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And has there ever been any talk about changing it, maybe putting it on a, a you know, on a, on the weekend, on a Monday or a Friday or something? Every year we hear that, com it comes up to say, well, why don't you do it on the Friday and why don't you do it on the Monday or whatever? But I think, uh, you know, tradition says that we do it on the Wednesday and I think it works. I think people really enjoy uh, that Wednesday, that midweek of Regatta Week. And as, as you know, we're the anchor of the George Street Festival. So that starts the following week and then they come right up until the Wednesday. And then the, the anchor, of course, is in our regatta day. Yeah. How many people do you think will be walking around this lake tomorrow morning? That's a number, I guess, that we can't, that we don't know. But w if we have a really fine day, if we have a good day, lots of sun out, and even if it's a little cloudy like this today, we'll, we'll see fit forty to 50,000 people for sure.
Well, coming up, learning to play the ukulele. We'll take you to an unusual music class for kids in Port Blandford. Welcome back to Here and Now. Some of this province's newest musicians may be getting their start in Port Blandford this week. Children ages four and up are taking ukulele classes in the town. It's organized by the Port Blandford Green Team. Here now is Garrett Berry went down to City Hall to sit in on a class. Here's how it went. What is your favorite song that you've learned here at camp? Uh, Rolling Boat. Can you play that one for me? Rolling Boat, ship me down the street, Mary, Mary. What is it? Bug Catcher. The recreation program here in Port Blanford usually has a children's program throughout the summer. And at the beginning of the summer, it wasn't looking too great, and we weren't sure if they would be able to have a kids' program. So we took it upon ourselves to decide to start teaching ukulele to the kids in Fort Blanford because most of our teammates are pretty uh, musically involved, so we thought it would be a good idea. How much do you have to practice at home? One or two. One or two what? Times a day. One or two times a day. And how long will you practice? Uh, about for a minute or a second. More than one second, but less than one minute? Hmm. Something like that. There you go, you got it. So that's G7, okay? You think you guys can remember that for me? Yeah. How many times do you think you've played Row, Row, Row Your Boat? A lot. Can you tell me about the ukulele that you have? Purple. Where did you get it? Um, music store. And if you had to pick any song to learn, not just Row Row Your Boat, what song would you pick to learn? Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Uh, 
<laughs> Interviewing kids isn't always easy. And to a very different story now, a piece of Newfoundland technology that's been busy at work in Lake Ontario. It's an underwater robot from Kraken Sonar, and it started looking for models of the Avro Aero fighter plane. Stephanie Skanderis has the story. After a year of preparation, the Thunderfish is ready. It's an unmanned, battery-powered vessel created in Newfoundland that will sink to the bottom of Lake Ontario to search for nine missing models of the Avro Arrow. For this Royal Canadian Air Force historian, it's a treasure hunt. I guess you could call them almost a holy grail of Avro artifacts. Richard Maine scoured historical documents to help narrow the search to 100 square kilometres off Point Peter, Ontario, where the models, each one-eighth the size of the arrow, were strapped onto rockets and fired over the lake between 1954 and 1957. They're fired off in the lake and they haven't been seen or, or touched since. So uh, they're going to be an incredible find and I, I think it will help Canadians reconnect uh, with the Avro story. This is the Arrow. It's a tale many Canadians know well. A supersonic interceptor developed by the Canadian military in the mid-1950s, but scrapped in 1959 by Prime Minister Diefenbaker when it reportedly got too expensive. It was right to end it. More than 30,000 men and women lost their jobs. It was Canada's third largest industry at the time. The leader of the new expedition says if the program had continued, Canada could have been a world leader in aeronautics. Certainly the, the, these models are a reminder uh, of what could have been in Canada. Because of past missions, the team already has a rough idea of the location of five of the models. To find the other four, they'll run the underwater sonar eight hours a day for the next two to four weeks and analyze its data. They're not sure exactly what they'll find or how intact the models will be, but they have all the necessary permits to bring them to the surface if they're found and hopefully put at least two on display in museums in Ottawa and Trenton, Ontario. Stephanie Scandaris, CBC News, Toronto. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. You know, Carolyn, a lot of people take this week off every year because this is a good time to take vacation without having to take a full week if you're in St. John's. So when you're looking ahead to the long range for the rest of the week, the weekend, We've had a really good run. I think everyone yeah. feels like they're like just waiting for that. It's going to turn any day now. <laughs> know, Our right? luck has run out. <laughs> No, fortunately, the cool temperatures that we're seeing today and tomorrow is just kind of a mid-week bump. So oh, good. things should start to rebound as we get closer to the weekend. Some warmer temperatures on the way, which is great news. Let's uh, take a look at the weather, shall we? This is uh, how it's looking for tomorrow. Regatta Day, of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, going to start the day in St. John's with some drizzly weather. Things should start to clear off, but it will be a pretty gray, cloudy day, light wind. So things are looking pretty good for the regatta to get the green light tomorrow. Temperatures for the rest of the island. Uh, we're going to have some drizzly weather as well in central parts of uh, the island. That should clear off in the afternoon as well. Looking really nice on the west coast tomorrow. Nice warm temperatures in Corner Brook. 22 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud there. Looking lovely along parts of the coast of Labrador. 23 degrees in Makovic tomorrow. Cartwright 21 with lots of sunshine. Some showers for much of Lab West tomorrow, though, and slightly cooler temperatures. So looking ahead to uh, Thursday, Wednesday night into Thursday, you can see some showers there in Labrador. Things are looking uh, fairly clear on the island there. Some nice weather, as I mentioned, on the way. Still lots of shower action, though, uh, coming through uh, parts of Labrador. So this is... Uh, Moving into Thursday, you can see the island uh, temperatures already starting to warm up uh, in the east. 19 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud in St. John's. Grand Falls, Windsor looking at 25 degrees on Thursday. 27 in Corner Brook. So things are uh, shaping up to be quite nice as the week goes on. But you can see that shower action there in Labrador. Happy Valley, Goose Bay. Some, some showers there. 23 degrees. Cartwright, 25. So still very warm on 
on Thursday, but just a little bit wet. Looking ahead to Friday, still we're seeing some more showers in Labrador along the Straits, and some of this could also uh, hit parts of central Newfoundland as well. So we have a chance of showers here for Grand Falls, Windsor on Friday, 27 degrees, 20 degrees on Friday in St. John's, a mix of sun and cloud there. So looking quite lovely as we're heading into the weekend. And uh, you can see that band of showers in Labrador as well, but things still pretty warm in Happy Valley. Goose Bay, 24 degrees as the high on Friday. Lab City looking lovely as well, uh, and 21 degrees as the high there. So you can see it is quite a nice week uh, in St. John's and eastern parts of uh, the island. Temperatures in the low 20s with uh, some cloud and some sun and uh, nice warm temperatures as well uh, in central and western parts of the island. So in Labrador, lots of showers to come, but at least it's going to be warm and uh, in the long range. On Tuesday, it looks like things will start to clear off. Temperatures uh, in the mid-teens. Well, we have not just one, but two young athletes to introduce you today. Cousins Autumn Decker and Bridget Burry of Labrador City are very busy little five-year-olds. Autumn and Bridget are both in level one competitive gymnastics. They also participate in swimming, skating, dance, and softball. Awesome work, Bridget and Autumn. You are our young athletes of the day. Well, a Happy Valley Goose Bay man has biked 7,000 kilometers across the country to raise money for the Children's Wish Foundation. We'll find out about his inspiration after the break. Welcome back to Here and Now, and as we told you earlier in the show, Matthew Pike finished something remarkable today. The Labrador man completed a cross-country bike ride in just under two months. The journey took him from coast to coast, all the while raising money for the Children's Wish Foundation. Here's some of what he had to say as he crossed the finish line today. Feeling fantastic. I mean, as soon as I came around the turn and I saw all the crowd here, certainly uh, gave me a bit of energy. Today was, uh, well, the last week in Newfoundland has been especially tough. It's uh, hills from coast to coast and the wind, and it's uh, 
it's been certainly a challenge and we scheduled it for two o'clock and I think 205 I got here so we're we're pretty lucky to have the good timing <laughs> typical day for me I wake up five o'clock in the morning I uh, pack away my tent wherever I'm set up to whether it's in a campground or side of the highway and then pedal I try to get 100 kilometers in before lunchtime and then rest of the day try to get another 100 kilometers in and uh, just go and go it's eat sleep and eat sleep and ride that's basically what the last two months look like tell me a little bit about why you did this so the big reason why I did this was this man right here my, my cousin Craig Pike uh, unfortunately he passed away a few years ago uh, today would have been his 37th birthday uh, just coincidence that it happened that way so I guess it was meant to be that I finished on his birthday uh, when I decided to do this trip it's always been a lifelong goal of mine uh, I wanted to do it for a charity and this is and the Children's Wish Foundation is near and dear to our family so he was a wish child obviously you got to meet uh, Wayne Gretzky when he was a young fella so we picked this charity and the response has been fantastic the goal was 10,000 because that's the average cost of a wish uh, so you know I was optimistic. Ten thousand dollars is a lot of money, and it's a lot to expect from people. But I had some friends of mine just donate, you know, paychecks of theirs. So two thousand dollars here, two thousand dollars there, and uh, we got the first wish. And then people people kept donating, and then we got to the second wish, and now we're on our way to a third wish. So we're over twenty-five thousand dollars right now, and I couldn't have imagined we ever get to that point. But people in Newfoundland and Labrador, especially up in Labrador where I'm from, uh, they've been donating very generously. My biggest emotion today is joy, happiness, and very uh, excited that Craig left such a legacy behind, that people would go as far as right across Canada and support Craig, uh, because he, um, he loved life, he enjoyed the simple things in life, and everyone who knew him, I think, and I know I'm probably bragging a little, I'm his mom, uh, but other than the bias, uh, today proves he was a good man and um, even though it's short life, like I said, it was a well-lived life. Well, from flight delays to passengers being bumped, Canadian airlines have had their share of bad publicity, but that doesn't seem to be having an effect on their bottom line. The CBC's Jacqueline Hansen has more. For years, it's been notoriously difficult to make money in Canada's airline industry. It seems that's changed. They're in a really good position. They, um, both Canadian airlines, really. WestJet's profits soared 32% in the most recent quarter. Air Canada's jumped by almost twice that, to $300 million, a record for the airline. The lack of competition has really allowed both Canadian airlines, but especially Air Canada, to exploit the situation. Canada's two dominant carriers have had it especially good thanks to low oil prices. When fuel prices tend to go up, airlines are very quick to you know, pass that on to consumers. When they fall, they don't do the same, they don't do the reverse. Um, that's very clearly established by research. We've looked at the data very carefully. Most customers probably suspect that and that is absolutely going on. And while business has been booming, so have the voices of some customers complaining about policies such as overbooking. Went to go on the plane and couldn't get on it, so they bumped me to another flight. And then they lost his luggage. Record profits could be used to help make the passenger experience better, according to this passenger advocate. But he says they're not. Bottom line is I would like to see real competition. We are very far from that situation. For now, the best hope for competition comes from one of the big players. WestJet has plans to launch a new low-cost carrier, but the airline said today it won't get off the ground until next summer. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. In other airline news, Air Transat has apologized to passengers who were stuck on a plane in Ottawa on the ground for five hours. It happened yesterday when a flight from Brussels was diverted because of a storm. One passenger described conditions on the aircraft as inhumane. It was hot, there was no water, there was no food. So, like, a passenger called 911 being like, this, this is insane. Paramedics and police boarded the plane, handing out bottles of water. Meantime, passengers vented their frustration on social media. Air Transat says the delays were because of congestion on the ramp in Ottawa and a lack of fuel. That's why it says there was no air conditioning on the stranded plane. HBO's medieval fantasy drama Game of Thrones is really, really popular. Easily the most watched program in HBO's history. Every Sunday, fans tune in to see which character is going to die next. 
But as Lorenda Redekop explains, the problem is not that so many people love it, it's that so many people refuse to pay for it. Amy Lehman never misses a new episode of Game of Thrones, even though she doesn't have cable. Um, I've streamed it online illegally, um, I've watched it at friends' houses, um, I've borrowed friends' bell logins to watch it. She's not alone this record-breaking season. Close to two million Canadians watched this season opener legally, but around the world, millions more streamed it illegally. Whatever stands in our way, we will defeat it. A British piracy monitoring group puts that number at 90 million. If you give people the option to stream the shows they want... Dan Deeth works for a company that tracks home internet usage. He says illegal streaming has exploded, with options like Android boxes, which cause problems for networks like HBO. You know, I, I say the mum test. My mum could use some of these boxes and these services and find these illegal streams uh, where 10 years ago might not have been possible. HBO has sent notices to suspected rule breakers asking them to stop. In a statement to CBC, Bell Media calls piracy of Game of Thrones extremely disappointing. It encourages fans to subscribe to HBO Canada, where they can watch all seasons. But in the U.S., people can get HBO shows online and pay for them without cable. A Canadian internet advocacy group wants to see that here. Canadians look to our neighbors south of the border and say, you know, why can they have that and we can't? And it's just another example of, you know, the way in which Canadian customers are unfortunately finding themselves shortchanged by our big telecom companies. Amy Lehman will pay for season seven once it's available on iTunes, just as she has for all the other seasons. But she's not willing to miss the show now and refuses to pay for cable to get it. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. If you're a baseball fan, you probably won't likely forget the wild card games between the Toronto Blue Jays and the Baltimore Orioles last October, when a beer can tossed by a drunken Jays fan narrowly missed an Orioles outfielder. Now, now Ken Pagan is talking openly about his past year. I was breathless. I did not want to draw attention to the group I was with, so I got out of there. I realized I, I should not be here. Um, obviously I did something wrong. Now Pagan turned himself into police a few days later. He apologized and pleaded guilty and then was given a 12-month probation sentence. He also lost his job and he's been banned from attending any Major League Baseball games. Pagan will share his story in an exclusive interview on The National tonight. Well, the world's newest, longest pedestrian suspension bridge has opened here in Switzerland. But it's no place for those who are afraid of heights. The bridge is now considered the longest at 494 meters, and it's 85 meters off the ground. It cuts the journey across the valley from four hours to a mere 10 minutes. We'll be back with more of your Here and Now journey in just a few minutes.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Safe to say this wasn't in the job description. Have a look. It's not, it's not small. Well, this video comes to us from a news station in Australia and shows an office assistant capturing a snake that was found curled up inside an edit suite. Armed with both a bent coat hanger and some nerves of steel, she managed to get the reptile out of its hiding spot and eventually into a very official-looking snake-holding shopping bag before it was released into the bushes and slithered out of the spotlight. And I'm sure that our editor, Paul Pickett, is relieved that this wasn't in his edit suite. Well, earlier in the week I showed you my catch of the day, but take a look at this catch of the day candidate. Oh, second and ten, a pump in, looking for Carter, jump ball! Oh, what a catch! Did you see that? Touchdown! Well, this isn't one you can eat. Deron Carter's amazing one-handed catch from Saturday's Argos Rough Riders game, but there's even more to this highlight play. After the touchdown celebration, he gave the ball to a 12-year-old fan named Paige Hansen. It turns out Paige is a cancer survivor and says CFL football helped her get through three tough years of treatment for leukemia. Carter later signed the ball for Paige after the game, making the experience even more special. Oh, nice. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh lovely. Uh, even takes it to bed. Very nice. So let's have one last look at the weather forecast before we leave you tonight. You can see how things are warming up as the week progresses for many places in the east. We go from 14 degrees on Wednesday to 20 on Friday. Northern Peninsula and southeastern Labrador are looking good too. Wednesday at 13, but by the time you get to Friday, 23 degrees. So some nice temperatures on the way. And I uh, just wanted to show you this lovely photograph that was put on Ryan's Facebook page. This is uh, the Port of Port Peninsula on the West Coast, mainland. Beautiful. Well, and speaking of Ryan, he's going to be down at the regatta tomorrow, yes. even though it's his week off, and he'll be at the dunk tank. He will. It's 10 o'clock. Ryan will be in the dunk tank. So if you've ever hated his forecast, this is your chance. <laughs> a little bit of payback. Good night. Have a good night.